I thought I'll start my presentation by uh, describing a recent case just to put a bit of clinical flavor into the presentation. So this is a 56-year-old lady who presented with uh, mild exertional dyspnea. She's had long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, which has become continuous over the last three to four years. And the echo shows severe mitral agitation, and the mechanism is quite complex. Uh, the valve is very dilated. There's a lot of redundant leaflets. There's multiple flail segments, and there's quite uh, significant uh, annular calcifications. So this patient had a very nice uh, mitral valve repair. We have a completely competent valve, uh, good cooperation, good leaflet mobility. And we asked ourselves, uh, if we put this operation today in a current time, uh, in the timeline, a hundred years ago, uh, we thought we had reached the limits of what we can do to the heart. And in fact, at that time, um, Theodore Bureau, the Austrian surgeon, actually said that a surgeon who operates on the heart should uh, uh, lose the esteem of his colleagues. Now, uh, 50 years ago, when the heart lung machine first started, uh, the results were so poor that it would be unlikely to offer a 56-year-old lady with mild symptoms who probably has many more years ahead of good quality living such a high-risk operation. In the uh, 1990s, during my training days, uh, there will be a lot of debate about offering these patients an operation uh, because it will be perceived as high risk, especially the uh, annular calcification. She will need to be on warfarin. Um, what about 2016? Is offering this patient a safe mitral valve today all we can offer her? Uh, what about her atrial fibrillation? This patient had, uh, on top of the mitral valve repair, a complete occlusion of the left atrial appendage and a cox maze uh, 4 operation, leaving her in uh, uh, sinus rhythm. And I think this present, represents the state of the art in terms of patient care today, that would provide her the best chance for an uh, anticoagulation-free future. So my talk this morning is uh, will be focused on ablating the uh, atrial fibrillation. And to do this, I want to share with you my journey of uh, ablating atrial fibrillation and we'll focus on the concepts and principles because if we understand this, it will allow us to evolve um, because what is the state of the art today was certainly not the state of the art yesterday and it will be unlikely to be the state of the art tomorrow. Now, the first point to make is that a cox maze 4 operation uh, or, or the maze procedure is not a specific surgical operation but rather a concept. And the concept is based on what Dr. Cox and many before him have already uh, uh, have found. And the atrial fibrillation is driven by multiple macro reentrant circuits that occurs at random throughout both the left and the right atrium. Now, more recent work by Hazard Gary actually found that there are trigger factors that usually reside in the posterior left atrium, which can initiate uh, atrial fibrillation. So, in general, AF surgery cannot be map guided like other arrhythmia surgery. So, the only way to effectively abolish AF is to place lesions within both the left atrium and the right atrium that will preclude the development of multiple uh, or uh, large macro reentrant circuits. And to do this, we have three ways of doing it. We can either break off the atrium completely, um, we can create le uh, radio lesion sets, or we can create a maze pattern uh, to abolish these uh, macro reentrant circuits. And we chose the maze pattern because it is the most effective way to actually abolish all these macro reentrant circuits. And we leave the, the possibility that we can actually restore normal sinus rhythm in these patients. Now, in 2001, when we started our uh, surgical uh, concomitant AF program, the only energy source that was available in Australia was the unipolar radio frequency device. And I felt that this device did not fulfill the requirement of what we need for the maze operation. In other words, we couldn't achieve uh, transmodality continuity without causing collateral damage. So when we started our program, I elected to go on with the classical maze using a cut and sew lesion. And we could show that even for a young surgeon, which I was at that time, that we can actually perform this operation safely, uh, provided that you are trained well and understand the pitfalls of the operation, and with the same efficacy as those published in all the major centers around the world. But clearly, it is not an operation that is going to be widely accepted. And in 2003, uh, Medtronic was the first company that brought in the bipolar radio frequency device. And I think this provides a change. And this, we, we now actually have a tool that has the potential to give us transmodality, continuity of lesions without collateral damage. And so virtually overnight, we changed the operation using the same lesion sets. Um, uh, if I can, can, can I go back? Oh, that's OK. So using the same lesion sets, uh, but 
as many of the lesions that are now created by the bipolar radiofrequency device. Now, for many years we've done that. We haven't. Uh, we don't actually know what our results was. And two years ago, one of our students actually looked at the first 50 consecutive patients who underwent the first uh, uh, these operations. So we have a very long follow-up of 9.3 years. And the amazing thing to me, for a cohort of patients that uh, uh, predicts very poor conversion, we actually have almost half the patients in this group at 9.3 years who are still in sinus rhythm without antiarrhythmics. But even more impressive is that we have no thromboembolic strokes in the several hundred years, uh, patient years follow-up in this group of patients. We did have one hemorrhagic stroke in a patient who was not on warfarin. Since then, multiple randomized trials have been done in the world to compare concomitant surgery with or without ablation. And in every one of these trials, what we see is that if you uh, ablate the, at, uh, the atrium uh, at the same time, the freedom from at uh, atrial fibrillation was much better. I think it's important that we learn as much from our failures as our successes. And there's a couple of things, points to make. And if you analyze the data, the theme is consistent, that if the more complete the lesion sets is, the better the results. So biatrial lesion sets will have better results than left atrial uh, lesion sets alone. Left atrial lesion sets compared to primary vein uh, isolation will also produce uh, superior results. In this publication from uh, Japan, uh, again providing some interesting insights into the um, um, AF ablation, where they look at failure in patients who had previous surgical concomitant ablation. And what they found is that if failure occurred, it's usually to two pre uh, predominant uh, mechanisms. And one is that uh, patients can uh, fail because of macro reentrant through gaps, or they can fail because of focal uh, mechanisms. And this reinforced the concepts of the maze procedure. Now, remember in 2001, when we started the program, there was no consensus statement to guide us in terms of recommending atrial fibrillation. In fact, there was dissent even within the own craft group as to whether we should be doing a maze pro uh, uh, procedure in these patients. Since then, more data have emerged, and now um, all the major societies have come with a consensus statement to state that it is appropriate that all patients with symptomatic AF referred for other cardiac surgeries undergo an ablation procedure at an experience center. And in fact, the ISMIC Society was a bit more specific in their recommendation, and they actually gave a class one level A recommendation to improve sinus rhythm at both short and long term, a class two A level B evidence to reduce stroke and thromboembolic events, a class two A level B to improve EF, class two A level A to improve exercise tolerance, and a class two A level B to improve long term survival. So today, I think the COTSMAS 4 remains a state of the art for patients. And in my own practice, I have switched over to the Atricure Synergy, uh, Synergy Clamp uh, since they got this device into Australia, because I think this device uh, today provides the, is the most technology advanced bipolar radio frequency clamp. And I combine that with the cryo ice um, uh, probe at areas where we cannot use the bipolar radio frequency clamp to complete the lesions to ensure that there's uh, minimal uh, chances of any gaps occurring. So in summary, for concomitant atrial fibrillation, today we should be questioning reasons that we, should, uh, we, we do not want to ablate uh, concomitant AF. And when we do so, we must follow the principles of the maze procedure. I do think we need a combination of bipolar radio frequency and cryo energy to, opti uh, to achieve the optimal uh, lesion sets. I think we must obliterate all the left atrial appendage effectively in all patients. And although I haven't shown any data, and it's got a controversial statement here, I, I do think it's reasonable to discontinue oral anticoagulation three months after ablation if the patient is in sinus rhythm without any other indication for uh, anticoagulation. In the last few minutes, I want to turn my attention to uh, surgical management of uh, standalone atrial fibrillation. Now, if an invasive uh, therapy is indicated for patients because of symptomatic atrial fibrillation, so, uh, catheter ablation remains the treatment of choice for most patients. However, disappointment with the results of catheter ablation for patients with non plasmal atrial fibrillation and the fact that the left atrial appendage is not managed at the same time have led to a resurgence of interest in surgical ablation, certainly in Europe and in the uh, United States. There's no question that the COSMASE 4 operation is also highly effective for patients with standalone atrial fibrillation. But the problem with that is it requires us to put patients on cardiopulmonary bypass to achieve all the lesion sets. And this is not palatable for many patients or their referring physicians. So more recent development have resulted in less invasive means to achieve the operation. So we now do ablation by total endoscopic approaches. And uh, 
But obviously, there has to be a compromise, so we can't do the full maze lesion sets, but we focus predominantly on a pulmonary vein isolation or some sort of ablations on the posterior left atrium. But we're able to use our most effective tool that we have, which is the bipolar radiofrequency clamp. And this picture here uh, actually shows uh, a photograph of one of our recent patients where we see that the three uh, ports uh, scars in the right chest and similarly three port scar on the left chest. The bottom scar on the left chest is a longer uh, scar where we put a clip in uh, to uh, occlude the left atrial appendage. There are many papers now also published to show the efficacy uh, of all these endoscopic approaches, but there's only three randomized trials comparing catheter and surgical ablation that's been published so far, and we'll go through a couple of them. The first trial is the FAST, uh, FAST trial, and in this trial, they randomized patients with difficult to treat uh, standalone atrial fibrillation, either because they have uh, felt a previous catheter ablation or if the atria were enlarged. And they randomized them to either receive uh, a TT uh, surgical ablation or uh, catheter ablation. And there's no question the superior results in terms of uh, rhythm conversion with the uh, surgical group. This study uh, has been dismissed uh, because of the higher adverse event rate in these patients. But it's, I think it's fair that we need to look at what actually drove this adverse event. And most of these adverse events was driven by either pneumothorax or hemothorax, which is part and parcel of uh, having an endoscopic uh, trans, uh, 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 thoracoscopic approach. So if we actually remove those pneumothorax, hemothorax, which are inconsequential complications, we find that, in fact, the morbidity or adverse events between the two approaches are very, very similar. Similarly, the other randomized trial that's been published compares patients who has had one felt previous catheter ablation. So patients who have undergone a catheter ablation have felt, and then they randomized that group of patients to either a, a surgical ablation or a catheter, further catheter ablation, again showing that the surgical ablation has far superior results in this cohort of patients. The same criticism applies for these patients in that the adverse van events reported was much higher in the surgical group. Similarly, if we take out the uh, hydrothorax, uh, hem uh, pneumothorax, groin hematoma complications, we find that in fact the adverse events rates are almost identical between the two groups of patients. So in summary for standalone AF uh, patients today, we, we do see limited efficacy of catheter ablation in non plasma atrial fibrillation. We do have more palatable surgical approaches available for our patients today. And I do think that a collaborative hybrid approach offers optimal state-of-the-art care and safe left atrial uh, appendage management. And this treatment should be considered for patients with standalone atrial fibrillation that are difficult to manage, including those with non plasma atrial fibrillation or those with felt catheter ablation. I think it's also reasonable to consider this treatment for patients with plasma atrial fibrillation, especially if they know that the left atrial appendage can be effectively managed. Thank you very much.